Coming up on Tech News Today, Facebook gets down with a botanist, as well as revealing its 10-year plan the next 10 years at its F8 developer conference. HTC releases its next company-saving phone, and it looks pretty awesome. Uh, how email is the tool of the working class in the eyes of Generation Z. And you might have to hand over your device the next time you get into a car accident. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1490, recorded Tuesday, April 12th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service and the most sophisticated way to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT and sign up for your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash TNT. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about technology news with people who like to rollerblade through technology. I am True. Megan Maroney. Uh, I'm Jason Howell, not a rollerblader myself. Are you, Megan? You know, I, I think roller derby okay. is different than rollerblade. Okay. I might have already it's insulted a, our guests. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I'm actually very curious now, and I want to know if Serenity Caldwell from Imore uh, rollerblades or roller skates while roller derbying. That's really hard to say. What do you do? The, the answer is roller skating. Okay. Quad skates. Okay. All right. No no single stream roller blades <laughs> okay. in roller derby. <laughs> Wouldn't dare. I no, hope we can still no, be friends. <laughs> we can. It's okay, all good. good. It's all about education, Megan. <laughs> yes, for everyone. A teachable moment. Exactly. Yes, exactly. we've all learned something. It's great to have you here, Serenity. It's great to be here. I always love hanging out with you guys. Excellent. Uh, should we do this? I think we have yes. something that, Serenity, you might have uh, a little bit to weigh in on this first story. Because there's uh, particularly in the world of Android, there aren't many times where we have like an Apple thread into the technology. We do this time. Mm -hmm. HTC <laughs> hopes to change its downslide of recent years in the world of smartphones with today's announcement of its latest flagship device, the HTC 10. Of course, there are the expected core upgrades for a modern flagship Android device, things like a Snapdragon 820 processor, fingerprint scanner, quad HD display, four gigs of RAM, USB-C, blah, 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 unibody, metal design with chamfered edges, all that stuff. But the HTC 10 is doing some interesting things to kind of set itself apart, because in the Android device world, you really have to try and set it yourself apart. First, camera-wise, it's sporting, quote, the world's first optically stabilized larger aperture f 1.8 lenses on the front as well as the back so both cameras are kind of like this spruced up uh great and low light uh cameras so i'm very curious to see how those perform also support for high resolution audio at 24 bits including a high powered headphone amp and even high res audio recording when you're recording video on the device so definitely a a step up in the world of, of high def audio if, pe if that's important to people it also comes with free uh-oh protection, as they call it, <laughs> meaning that HTC will replace cracked screen devices for free up to one year after purchase. I think that's a really awesome deal uh, and definitely a, a great way for HTC to kind of start gaining back customers. And finally, Serenity, this is what I was talking about. I ought to raise an eyebrow or two, I think. It's the first Android device to stream natively to Apple's AirPlay and Apple TV, and which has me kind of wonder how we've not seen this kind of compatibility so far in the world of Android. I guess myself, I'm not an iOS user. I'm an Android guy. I just kind of assumed that things like this were off, you know, off the table for Android oh, devices. How, how, how is this possible? Well, um, AirPlay is an open standard. Uh, there are third-party, both third-party applications, even in the Android ecosystem, and of course, third-party uh, devices that support AirPlay, like third-party speakers, for instance. But it's rare. It's not something that you. Uh, it's not something that I think we've ever seen at the manufacturer level, right. uh, the smartphone manufacturer level, outside Apple itself. So to see it 
uh, show up natively on on an HTC phone is is definitely a little bit of a what? <laughs> and when we first heard the news, um, when we were talking to our our friends and coworkers at Android Central, you know, Phil, Phil Nicholson taps us on the sh- virtually taps us on the shoulder and says, "So this phone's gonna have AirPlay?" <laughs> and Renee and I both go, "Really? How uh-huh. does that?" Interesting. Uh, so it looks. From what I can tell so far, and I haven't gotten a chance, of course, to play with the phone yet, um, but it looks like it may be audio only. It may not stream video or its screen to the Apple TV the way that the iPhone does. It may just go, uh, it may just be able to play audio the way that you would be able to stream airplay to audio speakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but again, I'm not, I don't know that for sure, having not tested it. Um, and uh, you'll be certain that that's, that's one thing that we're going to get to do at iMore in the next few days is... Uh, is actually play around with an Android phone uh, to test an Apple feature. And that's, again, not something that we do very often. We did the move to iOS app. I think that's the last time I can right. think that, or, or Apple Music coming to Android. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, this little things, but maybe it's, I, I kind of secretly hope that maybe this is a, a sign of importance, importance to come. Maybe FaceTime will finally become an open standard like Apple has been promising for, oh, three years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, is this something that people have been clamoring for? I mean, I guess I get the standard, the open standard is something that would be great. Uh, you know, give me Amazon on my Apple TV and I will be happy. Uh, let me play Apple Music directly on uh, my Echo and I will be happy. But but AirPlay, is this something that I haven't heard people asking for this? I don't have an Apple TV, so I don't know. You know, all, all I can go off of is what I've heard a lot of iOS users and, and, you know, and Apple TV owners and everything, you know, it seems to come up a lot. So I guess you could tell me, uh, you know, whether it's something that's incredibly useful on the iOS platform. From an Android perspective, I'm kind of surprised that if HTC is doing this, that we haven't seen this more. Because when you're talking about support for hardware that's just out in the world, it seems like AirPlay, you know, supported devices, devices like speakers and all that kind of stuff, like... Android's always fighting to have this compatibility and the 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 world of Android compatibility with hardware is much better now than it was even a couple of years ago but I think this is a pretty big selling point personally it it means baked into the device without having to install an app and there are apps that exist in the Play Store that allow you to kind of stream AirPlay and, and that sort of stuff but without having to do that just baked into the the device is the support for a wide range of hardware devices and I th- I think that's a big plus I feel. Well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me, right? Because Google has focused very heavily on Cast for for a long right. time. Both it's you know the Google the the Chromecast in the back of the television, but also Cast to you know native TVs that had it built in. Uh, and for them to also support AirPlay, I feel like it's an admission that yeah, Cast is great and Cast works really well in certain circumstances. But hey, if you're if you're at a friend's place that has an Apple TV, or if you're living in a household that has both Apple devices and Android devices, and I know they exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there are people who have preferences, and your preference may not be Apple, but you may have Apple devices in your household, or you may have friends who have Apple devices and you personally prefer an Android. And I I honestly think that, you know, keep it, having everybody work together on the same same platform is is really nice, honestly. Mm-hmm. As somebody who did a lot with eBooks in the early days, and I still tinker with that uh, occasionally. Ebooks is a great example of something where uh, there's the EPUB standard. And then if you go into the world of Amazon, there's a whole bunch of crazy proprietary standards like Mobi and KF8. And trying to build uh, trying to build books across multiple platforms was always really annoying because you were like, but I want, you know, I want my book. It's just text and some photos. Why can't it be viewable easily on these multiple platforms? And it, it not only is frustrating for publishers of content, but it's also frustrating for, you know, users who, who just want to read books or in this case, listen to music or or stream their screen to their Apple TV or their te- or just their, you know, their regular television. I don't know. I, I think it's a it's an interesting move from HTC. And I would be really excited to see that come to other Android devices. Okay, so this uh, has AirPlay and it has quick charging mm-hmm. uh, and it has an SD Love card slot. Charging. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. It still costs $700. Like mm-hmm. how, how do we separate it? Um, how, what, what is this phone's place in the Android ecosystem? Uh, high-end premium device basically from HTC. Similar, uh, similar in scale to the Galaxy S7 series. Uh, similar, well, it, you know, the LG G5, even though it's not getting very good reviews. But these are the, these are the higher-end Android devices 
that you would compare, let's say, to the iPhone. You know, you, you spend a lot of money on an iPhone because you want quality. In the world of HTC, this would be that phone that you would do that for. Um, and I don't know, you know, it, the economics of Android devices, it's kind of in a weird state right now. We've gotten really accustomed over the last couple of years of getting really nice, performing, well-designed, great, you know, great kind of... Uh, the, the body of the device looks premium, all this kind of stuff for kind of mid range to maybe a little bit higher than mid range price for five, five fifty. So then you see something, you know, that comes in at seven hundred dollars, let's say, or whatever. And that feels pretty outrageous in comparison to that. But there's still a place for this. Some people really are willing to pay extra to have the best performing device that's on the market. And, uh, you know, this this has a lot of other a lot of other bonuses. I can tell you as a person who's dropped two devices now and cracked screens and had to get them replaced <laughs> that, you know, paying, let's say an extra hundred dollars for a premium device up front that I, <laughs> that that's basically insurance. You're paying for this insurance that sometime in the next year, if you ever drop it, Hey, you get it replaced for free. So that's got value. You know, it all stacks up. Well, I'm interested to see you compare it to the S7 because I know you ordered this phone and you have the S7. Yeah. So I would like to know what's the difference between those two. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I can't wait to play around with it. I will say if you're interested in getting this, it does start at $699, but there is a way if you do a search uh, for HTC 10 uh, code. Let me see here. I can, fi I can find the code. When you go through to uh, buy this right now and you do the code HTC 1008, you'll get $100 off. So I did that. So, you know, it knocks $100 off to, to kind of get it to you for $599 uh, to start off with. So yeah, if you're interested, I think it's it's it'll be interesting to see if this is a saving move for HTC. And I, I'm not sure that one any one phone can be. And HTC has an uphill battle to climb as far as that's concerned. They create great uh, devices often. Uh, but, you know, for whatever reason, they don't resonate. And I don't know if that's marketing or what it is, but they really need a phone to resonate. All right, moving on. First, Microsoft added a cute little ASCII smiley face to the blue screens of death, and now they're adding QR codes. The register says that Microsoft will include the scannable squares on their dreaded error pages, so you can aim your smartphone at them to go directly to a troubleshooting page instead of having to look up some confusing error code. Mm -hmm. The register also says this will give scammers a new way to get into our systems. Uh, they say fraudulent QR codes are a popular way for cyber criminals to lead us to malicious websites. So, yeah, this is just in the preview build for now, but it looks like something useful. I mean, I remember blue screen, screens of death, and you just had this error code that would take you who knows where. And this would be nice to be able to just scan your smartphone. Serenity, do you remember the time when QR codes were all the rage? <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, um, I don't know if they've ever been really the rage <laughs> outside of Japan. Sorry, I forgot my uh, air quotes. <laughs> yeah, all the rage. You know what? There are places where QR codes are useful, like two-factor authentication, uh, and they're, you know, it's not even a bad concept. It's just no. been horribly executed and horribly marketed. And people just look at these things and they're like, I don't, what, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, and, and especially if your smartphone, you know, uh, some Android phones, I think were built in, in the camera app where you could just point something at it and it would automatically register. Mm -hmm. But on an iPhone, you had to download a separate app if you wanted it to do anything. So you were just trying to take pictures of QR codes and you're just confused as to I don't get what that means uh I definitely on one hand yes I like the idea of no you don't have to type in super long error code or hand type in a super long web address to get to whatever the problem is so you can help troubleshoot your computer but uh you know the the security security analysts are right this is but this has the potential to to be a very bad very bad thing for end users, especially if they don't know the difference between a true Microsoft blue screen of death and mm -hmm. say, you know, a, a maliciously hacked version of this where that QR code leads you to a banking website or even just something that's like a Microsoft site that's like, but before we continue, we need the last four digits of your social security number and also your address. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I it wouldn't I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if people started using it that way. I, I would imagine it's pretty rudimentary for a hacker to figure out how to put up a full screen image, which is basically all they they would have to yeah. do. And when you take a look at this blue screen, like there's no there's no gradient in the background to have to match. There's no like complication in the image. It's quite literally a blue screen, which you know it's a blue screen of death. So that's what we've come to expect with a white QR code on top. Probably the easiest Photoshop edit 
ever exist, you know, ever created uh, to swap out one QR code with the other. So, yeah, it has the potential. I should I should also say that we use QR codes on all that Android. I actually find them pretty pretty useful for there for uh, app recommendations and stuff like that. So they have their time and place. Be interesting to see in the world of Microsoft and Windows, which has a very rich history of hackers, you know, targeting it. Uh, this seems like a low hanging fruit, <laughs> as far as that's concerned. Anyways, uh, David. Bitao, Bito, the former CEO of Secret, knows a thing or two about anonymous networks and further why they might fail. Secret did not survive. Uh, he took the medium yesterday to tell people why apps like Yik Yak might be having financial trouble right now, even after experiencing impressive growth in the beginning. Yik Yak currently valued at around $400 million, having raised more than $70 million to date, is experiencing significant brain drain, including most recently the departure of its CTO, Tom Chernetsky. Along with that, download stats, traffic charts, surveys, as well as a source uh, to TechCrunch seem to be confirming that the once hot anonymous sharing app uh, popular among colleges and universities, particularly, is seeing a heavy decline in new users and daily usage. David Bateau uh, says that the reason private or anonymous social sharing services continue to plummet is that they fail to foster a long-term community. Instead, they become kind of flavor of the week, faddish trends that just kind of die off as quickly as they burst onto the scene. Um, it makes a whole lot of sense, right? Like, how do you build community around an anonymous network of people that, you know, I mean, they're talking anonymously. They're not, they're, their names aren't necessarily associated to anything. So what's the long-term commitment uh, in that scenario? Do you think uh, private apps like these are just kind of doomed to fail, Serenity? What do you think? I honestly, when you're describing the highlights of that Medium post, and I, I read it earlier today, it kind of sounds like almost every random social media startup, not just the ones that are focused around secrecy and privacy and, you know, trading on, on internal uh, small groups. I think it's a really it's a really hard nut to crack the social the online social sharing experience, especially because we have such mainstays already in the world. And yes, mm -hmm. people are not going to want to use Facebook for certain reasons and people are not going to use Twitter for certain reasons. But when we talk about privacy and encrypted uh encrypted communications in small groups we have things like uh we have things like group me we have things like snapchat uh we have things uh i forget what the the app is i think it's transmission or something like that um that allows end-to-end -end encrypted uh signal. group conversation signal thanks uh yeah i'm i'm not the whole the whole post just strikes me as social media in general is a very hard field to crack into because it, it i feel like everything goes like this we Think about Peach. Remember Peach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really a great three example, day actually. explosion, right? Yeah. Where it's everybody hears about it. It's hot for 0.5 seconds. And maybe for in the case of bigger social media networks, uh, it that lasts a little bit longer, like Yik Yak, and then it plummets. And it's nothing to do, I, I honestly don't think it's to do with how well their, you know, their communities are built or anything like that. It's just people are going to go where their friends are. And if their friends are all saying this app is great and this app is usable and it's simple and it's not overwhelming me with features, uh, then they're going to go there. But people by and large are not, I don't think we are really interested in moving to new apps unless we, either there's a must have feature that was not previously available uh, or we're completely dissatisfied with the platform we're currently on. I think that's one of the reasons why Snapchat has done so well is that it took the idea of the, all right, the sort of ephemeral uh, social media mm -hmm. where it's here and then it's gone. Uh, it took that to, to great use and built a, you know, built an entire network around it. And kids who, you know, are coming into coming of age, look at something like Facebook and they say, well, that's, you know, there's way too much information there. And, you know, I know about kids who will create Facebook accounts and then temporarily delete them anytime that they log off so that they just can't be found on Facebook unless they're actually actively on Facebook. Huh. There's like lots of, lots of crazy stuff. So, but, but I don't see us, you know, I don't, I don't see users actively like with the exception of me wanting to claim a handle on a new social networking <laughs> site. Yeah. And I really don't sign up for things. I didn't sign up for Snapchat until three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And I didn't claim my handle as a result. Someone else says Saturn, those jerks. 
I, I completely agree. I think this is interesting. I think David Bittow, um is sort of making a defense of why his app yeah, failed. Probably, um, and probably that's, you know, that that's why you do, that's what you, part of what you do on Medium. Um, I do think it's just in general apps failing or just the flavor of the month. And especially if you're talking about with kids. I mean, like anonymous apps are really popular with kids. Yik Yak, uh, Ask FM. Uh, they're, and they're going to move from one thing to the next unless it's a Snapchat, unless it's something that um, catches on and you really have no idea what it is and, and what it's just some kind of magic, like, you know, a unicorn. Yeah, it's um, like lightning striking. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't know. <laughs> I think there are some points with anonymous apps worth making. There's a lot of liability issues. I mean, there's always cyberbullying issues. And I know when he uh, got rid of Secret, that was kind of what he was saying. Like, people, mm -hmm. I don't want to create an app where people are just horrible to each other. Um, so I definitely think that's true. Um, and, and I do think that teenagers are just like, they don't, they only need Snapchat. Like they feel like they don't, you know, they use a lot of other little things, but mostly, um, that's where they are. And they don't, as far as I can see, they don't see a need for anything else, but that doesn't mean they're not going to, you know, I mean, they're, they're not, no one, I mean, none of us have by, no, none of us really, I would move to something else besides Facebook if that's where everybody was. So, you know, it's no, there's no saying that Snapchat is the place that's going to be around in 10 years either. Mm-hmm. I do think there's something to the thought that an, on anonymous networks, you get a different type of communication. And by and more, I, w I wouldn't say more often than not, but often enough, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's the kind of communication that, like, why would I choose to expose myself to that for a prolonged period of time? Things like bullying, things like, you know, really nasty, let's say, jokes or whatever the case may be, depending on the, you know, the audience that's frequenting it. Um, so I could definitely understand why an anonymous network might have trouble in the long term because its users in the short term realize that with it comes this great power of talking anonymously about whoever and whatever. But in the long term, it has to get kind of grating, right? Like it has to be kind of depressing to go there day after day after day and be exposed to the same kind of, you know, negativity uh, long term. I just don't know if that lasts. But but you're right. Uh, what, what both of you are saying is absolutely true. It's really hard to expect that there will be many breakout hits just in the world of social and even just in the world of apps, period. Uh, it really is like, you know, capturing lightning in a bottle. Uh, it seems like you might have a great idea, but for some reason, it needs that extra spark to continue, and uh, it's hard to capitalize on that. Well, the other thing about anonymous apps is they're not collecting information about us. And so, I mean, the reason why Facebook is so popular is we've handed over so much personal information, and then they can deliver advertising based on that personal information. Yeah, no. If we're just all anonymous, you don't know what we like, you don't know what we're going to buy, we're useless today. Yeah, Yik Yik, Yik Yak, by the way, is supposedly working on direct message, they, they rolled out very recently the ability to have a name associated with your account so that they can bring in a little bit more of those kind of hooks, you know, not make it, make it maybe a little bit less anonymous. I wonder in this case if that just kind of like muddies the water for their yeah. service then because it takes everything that you knew about it, kind of turns it upside down. But yeah, it's probably probably the reason why. Right. Ask FM is another site where a lot of kids go to just, you know, ask any question anonymous, anonymously of anyone else. Um, and they, they're, the, those founders have moved on to, they just created a dating site called Mint. So I do think that there's no, uh, there isn't a long long tail for anonymous mm -hmm. apps for sure or maybe any apps as Ray was saying <laughs> doom and gloom <laughs> uh well some of yeah. us are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. some of us are worried about kids not going outside anymore others are worried about kids not communicating face to face anymore uh, but writing in the wall street journal christopher mims explores the question of kids who just don't use email anymore. Do they have to? Um, well, I guess once they get to the workplace, they probably have to. Some of the kids Mims interviewed said that they that sending their first email was more of a rite of passage than getting to vote for the first time. Uh, Serenity, I know you teach a college course, and I'm assuming that many of your students are Generation Z. Maybe they're older. I'm not sure. Uh, if they are Generation Z, do they use email? Ah, yes, uh, but very much the way that Chris is describing in his piece, which is to say that email is, I, I use email with them a lot because email is what they associate with their coursework, where it's very much, yeah, okay, I'm going to, you know, talk to you, my instructor, about this question that I have about my, you know, my podcast that I'm doing or this piece that I'm writing, I. Uh, and, but that's also because, you know, the teacher-student interaction is very much like, no, don't, please don't follow me on Snapchat. Facebook. Because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because this is not, yeah, it's this is not for you. Um, 
But uh, when they're interacting with each other, it's it's absolutely it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's Snapchat, um, it's Facebook Messenger, it's GroupMe. Uh, it's 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 not. I mean, honestly, even my generation, I feel like email is something that you know I I got into technology sending emails. One of the first things I did uh, on the internet was pen pal with another person via email about like the show ghostwriter which was like pbs from ages ago <laughs> um so there's there's your like my my early foray into email uh but nowadays i feel like when you're when, when you want to talk to somebody you know i use imessage i use slack i use facebook messenger if i don't have people to connect with either via imessage or slack or twitter or you know facebook uh, they're, they're just, there's so many different communication methods that email has almost fallen by the wayside as email is, is, is this generation's paper mail, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, we generation, generation X, generation Y, generation Z, if you want to throw on the entire millennials label, fine. Uh, we, you know, we don't really get a lot of paper mail out because all of our bills are digital. You know, and, and and most of us have opted out of credit card offers and pre-screens and all of that stuff. So the two things that you're getting in your physical mail are, you know, stuff from the DMV and Amazon packages. So anything that what you would consider official, say a college acceptance letter, for example, is all got done through the through email now. And that, you know, I think that's where the the Generation Z gap comes in is that people, you know, Gen Z thinks about, oh, email is where my important stuff comes in. And why would I clutter that with just conversations with my friends? I can do that on so many other networks. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because like it, it's email is so ingrained in in me, yet I don't like it very much mm -hmm. because there's this like pressure to really go into a lot of detail in email because you can um, it, but yet at the same time, if I'm like, you know, trying to communicate with a friend, let's say they might not necessarily be reachable immediately at that very moment, it, but I want to, I want to get my communication done. Like I want to get all my thoughts out there and email seems like the most obvious way to do that as opposed to like a text message that's like 5 million pages long with everything I need to say. It's just a different mindset. And I, I think what confuses me about this and, and it's so interesting to, to kind of read this because I, I, I agree with it to a certain extent. It's just the fact that we have so many different ways to communicate now. I don't know if that makes it any easier. Like, I no. understand you can find a way that works for you, but I now I just have this, like, communication confusion mm -hmm. as far as, like, what is the method that I use for this particular thing that I need to communicate? Is it easier for me to just send a text message, or should I really make this a Facebook Messenger thing? Or, heck, let's go into Gmail and add a bunch of people to it and, and make this a long-form, like, novel thing. I, I don't know. It gets confusing. I'm old. Right Right after the right space. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Two spaces after the period. I always add a, a punctuation at the end of my text messages, and apparently that makes me old. I don't even know You're anymore. You're just an old man. <laughs> I'm old. Yeah. No death to punctuation. <laughs> okay. Punctuation forever. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about this after the break, but um, I think I, I I know Facebook wants this. I mean, they they want us all to be on Messenger. They they have seen how much we hate email, and I do feel like they really would like to move that uh i'm guessing they they want to move they would love to move like the professional world and in, into that uh to, to that space too so it will be interesting because email is broken it's garbage i mean like gmail yeah. is perfect but aside from work from personal stuff i just can't it's just a whole, a whole bunch of non like it's just a pile of guilt for me of not responses <laughs> and it's never it ending yeah because there's always oh, something behind true. that last yeah. one it's true. Uh, you know what? I uh, my my guilty admission here is that I have almost entirely stopped paying attention to my email inbox, with the exception of my Emerson glass. And occasionally, if I have really important messages that I have to respond to from you know Apple PR or another PR company that I'm working with, uh, when I'm when I'm getting questions for stories, I just it's not something that's on my radar. I have mm -hmm. so many other apps open right now that are all grabbing my time email is oh god it's that to-do list or oh it's the it really list of flagged messages so that i know when i have to get on my virgin america flight like that's that's pretty much what my inbox has turned into mm -hmm. which is kind of depressing but 
<laughs> we both raps now. <laughs> All right. Well, after the break, Kurt Wagner from Recode is here to talk about the Facebook Developers Conference. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, ZipRecruiter. And we were just talking about Generation Z and their allergy to email and our own allergy to email. Now, if you are looking to hire anyone from that generation or even from our generation, you're going to have to find creative ways to find them because we are all not reading our email, apparently. Uh, one way to do that is ZipRecruiter. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find the candidates you want to hire. If you want to find the perfect person, you need to post your job on all the top job sites, and now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. If you're not sure how to create the right job ad, check ZipRecruiter's site. They have some really good tips on how to tell your company's story. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. And guess what? Today is Equal Pay Day, celebrating the goal to pay women and minorities the same pay for the same work as everyone else. Now, we talk a lot about the importance of hiring a diverse workforce, especially in the tech industry. If you want to find the perfect hires, sometimes you have to look harder than your own personal friend or family network. ZipRecruiter can take the pain out of all that searching. No juggling emails or calls to the, your office. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 800,000 businesses. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. All right, so Facebook held its anticipated F8 Developers Conference keynote this morning. Mark Zuckerberg took the stage before everyone else for about 45 minutes to give the kind of the broad strokes view of Facebook's upcoming changes for developers. Joining us to talk all about these new efforts is Kurt Wagner from Recode. How's it going, Kurt? Hey, Jason, how you doing? Excellent. It's great to have you here. Um, first and foremost, Mark opened his talk by, I don't know, going a little in the political uh, direction, choosing to kind of forgo the standard, we have this many developers supporting the platform, blah, blah, blah routine, uh, until later in the event, of course. Uh, more and more, it seems like big tech companies are using their voice and platforms to kind of push their own agendas on the wider political scale. Do you think that's a risky move for them not? Uh, it was it was fascinating to kind of be in there and realize that he was going in that direction because, you know, as someone who's heard a handful of these keynotes, you're right, they normally come out, say how important developers are to the company and share a few stats. And, and Mark was very much uh, talking big picture, right, talking about Facebook changing the world. Uh, he mentioned um, the need to break down walls and make sure that everyone's connected. Uh, talked a lot about internet.org and this idea of bringing uh, internet access to the masses. Uh, so it was very interesting when he had a he had an audience and he definitely took advantage of it. He talked a lot about the things that that Facebook cares about as a company and um, I, you know it was kind of cool actually to see uh, someone just kind of go for that uh, versus the the traditional method we're used to. I don't know if it was risky. I think. For someone like him who's been around and kind of earned the right to kind of say whatever's on his mind, uh, I, I didn't have a problem with it. Yeah, and you know Zuckerberg, he's very passionate about a lot of a lot of these things that he was talking about. So you know, you know, at least at least to a certain degree it comes from a, a place of good. And uh yeah, it was some very interesting stuff that he started with. A little, a little bit later, uh the big thing of course that we were expecting was a healthy dose of bot talk. Facebook unveiled mm -hmm. details on its messenger bot efforts. What do developers kind of have to look forward to there? Yeah, so they rolled out a, a couple of things, but I think the big one is um, a, a couple of APIs, which uh, essentially will allow developers to build bots into Messenger. So uh, this idea that instead of you know chatting back and forth with um, a customer service representative for 1-800-Flowers to place an order, you could open Messenger, go to the 1-800-Flowers bot, and then chat back and forth with literally a, a robot and place an order, pay for that order, make sure it's delivered, um, and uh, now th there's the technology there for any brand or retailer to kind of take advantage of this. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more bots there. And, and one of the other interesting things is like, you know, that's a pretty basic uh, use case, right? It, there's very much yes, no, a lot of yes, no questions. Uh, do you want these roses? Yes. Uh, do you want them shipped here? Yes, right? Uh, ideally, these bots are going to get more sophisticated. And so Facebook has been building artificial intelligence software so that you can have conversations with a bot that feel like they're conversations with a human, right? So actual, you can ask questions and, and it can understand them. Um, Facebook is also making that technology, at least some of it, available to developers. So for those who aren't, you know, they don't necessarily have the money or resources to build that on their own, they can kind of use Facebook's technology to, to build those kinds of uh, interactions into their bot. 
So this whole idea of you know chatting with a computer uh, through Messenger is going to be a big one. Um, and they announced a bunch of different partners today. So I think people who use Messenger are going to see a lot more of that uh, moving forward. So, Kurt, are you really enmeshed in the Messenger world? Like, is that something that you use a lot for your daily communication? Personally, uh, no. I do use it, but only with a select group of people. For me, I, that's kind of how I feel like with all my messaging services, to be honest. Like, I have my friends who uh, I will talk with on Messenger. I have friends who I may communicate with on WhatsApp, um, on Snapchat. And then uh, I, I, of course, use text quite heavily for, for the majority of my conversations. So for someone like myself, I don't use a lot of Messenger, but there are 900 million people who supposedly use it every month. So uh, there is an audience there, a huge audience there for Facebook to take advantage of from this business standpoint. So they may not be targeting me necessarily, but uh, there are people out there they're looking at. So I know on Android phones now you can choose to have your standard SMS be uh, messenger, right? Like you can have that. Delivered yeah, you know, right and I, I went looking for that, and I couldn't find the setting. I think it's rolling out to some people, but it's not a wide rollout at this point, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. But yes, that appears to be the the direction that Facebook's going back to, because they once offered that, and then they took it away because they said nobody's using it. Now I think they're going back in that direction. So Serenity, I'm curious, is that something that you would want, like on an iPhone, to be able to use to change your default SMS to something that more people could use, like your Android friends? Uh, yeah. I mean, as much as I love the idea of not running into green bubbles, I don't <laughs> think that my first inclination would be, yes, here, Facebook Messenger, here, have all of my data. <laughs> uh, in part because I do think that iMessage is a pretty secure system, as is. Uh, and also, I just, I don't know, enough of my friends don't use Facebook Messenger for it to make sense. Facebook Messenger is, again, I use it for very, uh, very limited conversations, usually about roller derby. Uh, because most of my roller derby friends are on Facebook and everyone else it's it's Twitter or iMessage or Slack um, yeah. and there's not there's no real je uh, encapsulation of everybody on Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's move on to live streaming. I, I make fun of live streaming even though I make my living out of live streaming which is confusing. It's what you do! <laughs> I make fun of amateurs live streaming. Oh, the amateurs. People are even more amateur than I am. Uh, so today, Mark Zuckerberg said that you can live stream on Facebook, not just from your phone, but from any device, even from your drone, because who among us hasn't wanted to do that uh, or watch that? I would like to watch that, uh, the live cool stream, especially the when they crash. Uh, tell us more about this, Kurt. Yeah, it was actually funny when he was uh, presenting, he, he kind of said the same thing. He's like, you could even live stream from a drone. And then this drone like lifted up behind him uh, with the camera and everyone was like, on the screen behind him and he was waving and people in the audience. It was just like one of those uh, super techie like scenes out of Silicon Valley from HBO. It was pretty great. But um, the whole idea here, right, is that Facebook really, really wants people to, to use this product to uh, live stream and a big uh, important kind of audience for them or, in or broadcast audience for them is people who are currently broadcasting on TV or on the web. And so uh, for those folks who maybe have more um, uh, traditional camera setups, they're not really going to be comfortable using a smartphone to broadcast the local news, right? But if all of a sudden they can use the existing cameras that they have um, to plug in and, and stream directly into Facebook, like they might be tempted to do that. So really what this does is it just simply says, hey, if you have any type of uh, camera that's not a smartphone, but you still want to participate in this live streaming thing, you can do it. Um, I don't know exactly how technical you have to be to set that up, but there are APIs for developers to do that. And so um, the idea is like, hey, let's not eliminate anyone who's recording on devices that aren't phones. Let's make sure they can participate too. And so that's what they're trying to do. Uh, speaking of cameras, this kind of seemed like it came out of nowhere, but it's incredibly cool. <laughs> Facebook showed off its surround 360 video camera uh, kind of rig for capturing 360 degree video uh, per that's perfect for VR. It looks like a spaceship, basically. Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of the interesting elements of this rig. Yeah, so this is, this is as you said, it kind of came out of nowhere a little bit. So Facebook has a three, uh, uh, an interest in 360 degree video for two reasons. One, they started to put a lot of that in news feed. And two, they have this device you may have heard of called the Oculus Rift, the virtual reality headset, which relies on a lot of 360-degree video. 
Uh, so for them, they have incentive to try and make sure people are creating this content so that there's a lot of it to consume on the headset. And uh, as a result, they built this cool camera that has 17 different lenses and then a software component to it that stitches all of those different frames together so that it feels like one continuous uh, you know, 360 degree view. Um, the interesting thing about this is they built the camera and they showed it off at F8, as you could see, but they're not actually selling it, right? So it's not like you could go to the store and buy this. Instead, they're putting the blueprints for this camera, all the specs and the design online. And then if there's folks out there who have the time or money to actually go build it, uh, they, they can do it. They could follow Facebook's game plan and get it done. Um, I think in theory, you know, the only people who are going to do that are probably other hardware makers. Yeah. But uh, Facebook is, you know, it's, they have more incentive to provide these blueprints to people who already kind of manufacture products like that in hopes that they will make it for them. And then Facebook isn't on the hook for, you know, uh, going through this big cumbersome uh, 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 manufacturing process and shipping these to people and actually like dealing with all that. They just simply say, here's something cool. You go build it for us. We'll take all the video when you're done. Yeah, more content for Oculus, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it really reminded me of the Jump VR system that we saw at Google I.O. last year. That was kind of a kind of a partnership with GoPro. Similar similar kind of, you know, spaceship looking thing that records uh, VR. Uh, very expensive in that case. Uh, mm -hmm. Talking thousands and thousands it's of like dollars. Like 15000 or something, yeah. yeah. So not necessarily, you know, easily achievable from a consumer standpoint, but an option nonetheless. Do we know cost on this or... or well, you know, for, for the pieces, it. for the parts, and, and yeah. construction. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not sure what the what the production cost was. It's actually a good question. I can try and uh, find out. But since they're not selling it, I don't know yeah. if they'll even talk about that. Uh, we may have to wait until the first couple developers decide to undertake the process and and see uh, what the final bill is. That could be actually a fun experiment. <laughs> That, a that experiment, but a fun yeah, one. exactly. I was like, "Hey, we should do that here in house." And yeah, it's probably <laughs> probably far out outside of uh, uh, of just an easy weekend project. <laughs> so. Sure. Well, Zuckerberg also well, uh, go ahead. Did you well, I was going to say sorry. Just one last thing that I, I thought was funny. Facebook's camera has seventeen lenses, and I think the Google one you mentioned has sixteen. Uh, one which louder. I just couldn't help but notice that uh, you always got to one up the competition. So I thought that was a, a fun little tidbit. <laughs> one louder. Exactly. I love it. Uh, and uh, speaking of wanting up uh, Google, uh, Zuckerberg laid out his future plan, 10 year future plan that included connectivity, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and augmented reality. Uh, and he also sort of alluded to a device that looks suspiciously like Google Glass. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Well, yeah, it was a very kind of vague uh, reference. Like, it's not as if Mark came out and said, hey, we're building this or we're going to build it. But then he stood there with this giant pair of glasses on the screen behind him that looked very much like sunglasses. Uh, yes, there's the, there's the photo there. Um, and so it's, it's hard not to obviously jump to conclusions. But I think the idea here, and a lot of people in the VR industry will tell you this, is that virtual reality is a very cool first step, right? But it's it's... Um, a solo event for a lot of people at the moment. Um, and eventually, people aren't going to want to walk around with this giant VR headset on. It's just not probable. It's not practical. Uh, but the idea of just wearing sunglasses or even like reading glasses that have a little lens in them that can project, uh, you know, augmented reality vi uh, uh, visuals, I think that's a real serious and potential uh, opportunity for someone like Facebook. And so the fact that they're bringing this up now after the rift has kind of been established and it's being it's finally being shipped i think they can finally start talking about augmented re reality without kind of dismissing the fact that hey we've made this big bet on virtual reality and that's kind of where we're at right now uh this is again 5 10 15 years down the road but um you know today now that they've actually shipped their previous headset i think they can finally maybe talk about it a little bit more openly without uh, uh, pouring cold water on their existing products. So um, my guess would be that's why we haven't heard about this until now. Well, Serenity, I know Apple seems to be uh, very silent besides some patents that we hear about, um, but there, there's not much in the AR, VR world from Apple. Uh, what are your thoughts on all this? Um, I honestly think that Apple is sitting and waiting and listening and working very hard in sealed rooms that we will never see any sight of until, you know, after there's already a device on the market. 
Now we might say the secret behind the scenes way of how Apple got to its VR solution. There's no question that the company Cupertino is absolutely working on something in the VR in the VR field. Whether that will ever see the light of day is debatable. Um, I, I, Apple tends to do this a lot with most of its products. It's very much a wait and see approach. It's look and see what the what their competitors are doing, what's working in this space, what's failing in the space, and is there something that they can do in this space to make it better? Because they're not going to just throw out a VR headset just to be in the VR space. If they're going to release something in relation to VR or augmented reality or what have you, it's going to be uniquely Apple, and it is it's going to at least in their minds, make that area better and uh, and introduce something that the world has not yet seen. Uh, the the small form factor glasses on your face, no extra battery pack attached to it. No, you know, wow, that's that's a long ways away. I I, <laughs> I don't know. Is that ten years? I don't know. It's impossible to look forward to the future. When you were watching the the Facebook announcement, you know, and they were showing the glasses on stage, it kind of showed this like contextual stuff scrolling on the glass itself. So totally alluding to the fact that it would be you know the Terminator view that we were talking about. Uh, I think uh, late last week on this show. Man, that just feels like a far ways out. But then at the same time, what's fascinating to me from from just F8 in general is that Facebook's been around for 10 years now. And they were really kind of projecting, this is the Facebook that you've known, and this is our 10-year plan. You know, and they got broad strokes, but it was really impressive to see kind of how how simple Facebook of the first 10 years appeared to be versus what their plans are for the next 10 years. So, you know, who knows? 10 years is a long time. And if you, if I had ever 10 years ago thought Facebook was going to be doing all the things that it's doing now, then I would have said, no way, impossible, uh, not going to happen. But uh, who knows? Maybe we'll see those tiny little glasses streaming AR content to our eyes in 10 years. I certainly hope so. Well, Kurt, do you think that the technology uh, is has as long way to go as just like our social acceptance of this? I mean, people walking around already like you know, there's so many people who love to make fun of VR face and you know goggles on face. But do you, I mean, do you think that? Uh, I mean, I guess ten years is a long time from now. But do you think that we have a long way to go before we'll accept people walking around with a Google Glass like device on their face? Well, I think it's it's all comes down to kind of the fashion of it, right? I mean, you think about any kind of wearable that if, if it looks cool, people are going to put it on whether it works super well or not. And so if they can make some kind of glasses that look really cool and happen to, you know, uh, convey any kind of AR features, right, where you're able to, to maybe read something in the corner of your eye, I, I think it could be something that people actually adopt. I'm, I'm kind of with Jason in the idea that it just seems hard to believe that we're, that 10 years from now this will happen. At the same time, I mean, 10 years ago, like the idea of uh, this smartphone seemed just bonkers, right? Mm -hmm. And and yet I can't imagine not being able to access the internet from uh, my mini computer in my pocket at all times. So I think things change pretty uh, quickly. And I think the fact that we've seen virtual reality jump just in the last two years from this idea that started on Kickstarter to an actual, you know, Oculus headset that's pretty cool for people who, who have tried it out. I mean, I, I think it's... Um, I don't know if it's the kind of thing that like everyone's going to rush out and buy because it's expensive, but I think the technology itself is pretty cool. Um, and that was two and a half, three years, right? So um, I, I'm weary or hesitant to write something off, but um, I, it does seem hard to believe at this point. And I think a key is going to be making it actually look cool because that was Google Glass's big downfall. Like you looked like a dork when you were wearing it and, and no one uh, outside of Silicon Valley was in, on board with that. So that was uh, that was a big issue. Yeah, and being able to successfully miniaturize all these things that right now take up so much space. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be a big totally. challenge. Yeah, I mean, but I think it was beyond look, looking dorky. People get freaked out when you have a camera on your eyes. I mean, yeah. when you're recording that. Maybe so 10 years that. from now, no, that'll just be normal. <laughs> It'll, it won't be a big deal. I mean, no. I think that's I what the, Facebook was. Yeah. Yeah, we're either going to live in a... In a state where uh no privacy it yeah. all good or we're gonna go the opposite direction so i mean that's gonna totally. be a huge debate in the next five years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it well, already is starting live, to be a huge debate yeah a huge part of that already right i mean mm -hmm. i i'm not even comfortable with this whole idea of periscope and facebook live on every corner and yet look at facebook is pushing this uh harder than it's pushed a product in quite some time and so True. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more live video, and if people can get comfortable with that, well, the next logical, you know, these are all stepping stones, right, to, to being comfortable yep. with the idea of 
uh, having a camera on your face at all times. So right. maybe, or, yeah. maybe we'll get there. Or on your drone. I mean, like the drone. We're already people are freaked out about oh, drones yeah. hovering over their lawn. <laughs> Let alone lawn. drones like, with like 360 I, I, degree cameras. Right. Flying yes. Everywhere. And I am I on Facebook right now? Like that. You know, so yeah, we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, awesome having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us to tell you tell us all your thoughts on the F8 conference. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. And I'm, I'm imagining people uh, can follow all your work, your continuing coverage at Rico.net. That's the place. <laughs> I'm, I'm there every day. You right. find me. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks, we'll Kurt. talk to you soon. See you. Bye-bye. All right, here's the part in the show where we hear from you. Daniel writes about why emoji don't translate across platforms. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, he writes, emoji are already part of the Unicode standard, so there are predefined code points for each emoji. The problem, as usual, he says, is copyright laws and Apple being difficult. The emoji graphics are copyrighted by each platform vendor, even though they individually represent one Unicode character. Apple has to do things its own way and more liberally interpret the Unicode consortium's reference drawings, making things like the standard pile of poo into what Apple calls smiling pile of poo. You can see how individualistic artists drawing emoji against a predefined reference drawing and a standard intent of expression will result in lots of variety and confusion. Uh, Serenity, what are your thoughts on the smiling pile of poo? <laughs> and how it translates across platforms. Oh, boy. <laughs> I well, know you must have thought <laughs> thought about this to a great I have, extent. I have. You know what? If I had, there's an, a smiling pile of poo emoji over on my fiance's desk that I wish I had within arm's reach right now. <laughs> I feel like that's just my, that's my... Uh, Reaction. <laughs> Excellent. I, yeah. <laughs> what else can you say about smiling pile poop? Uh, on, on that note, I know that uh, Serenity, I know that you have to get going. We really appreciate you joining us for as long as you could today. Serenity Caldwell, of course, imore.com. Tell people if you're working on anything uh, that you want people to know about or where they can kind of find your work. Absolutely. Well, you can find my my work on imore.com. Currently, I am working on a review of this guy, my beautiful 9.7-inch iPad Pro. Uh, I'm doing a an artist's review. So specifically, if you are thinking about getting the iPad Pro, is it a good artist's tool? Is it something that uh, that if you're a painter, a writer, a, you know, an, uh, any kind of digital artist, is it something that you should pick up? So hopefully aiming to have that later this week so stay tuned i'm guessing yes <laughs> only only because we have Spoilers. The, yeah I know. don't don't give it away don't give away the ending uh but i mean i can only uh, speak from from what i've seen around here at twit and uh greg who often runs our teleprompter for this show is a very talented artist he has the ipad bro and he does pr some pretty crazy things mm -hmm. with the ipad uh so pencil's amazing yes it really is sir right. caldwell thank you so much for joining us today Thank you for having me. Take right. care. Enjoy your evening, guys. All right, you too. All right, coming up, if you get into a car accident, your phone might be analyzed to see if you were distracted when it happened. How do you feel about that? But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode. That is Wealthfront. You invest for the long term, or you you know should be for you your family's financial health. Trying to do all that kind of stuff yourself is very challenging, uh, especially the right way. It's complex. It's time consuming. Luckily, there's Wealthfront. Traditional advisors charge huge fees, normally between 1% to 3% of what they manage. With Wealthfront, you pay one quarter of 1% a year. That's 25 basis points, zero commissions, no hidden fees. That's less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account. There are no additional charges for any of Wealthfront's services. You can actually get started investing today with as little as $500. Unlike other financial advisors, Wealthfront will not bog you down with dozens of questions. Uh, they've simplified their risk identification process. They've simplified the whole process, which allows you to begin investing sooner. It only takes a few minutes. Uh, all you got to do is sign up at Wealthfront.com, and it goes right to work. It monitors your portfolios around the clock. It takes action as soon as an opportunity happens to arise. Uh, Wealthfront portfolios are based on modern portfolio theory. They're designed to adjust according to your own personal risk tolerance, they stay diversified as well as tax efficient, and Wealthfront's transparent and accessible. You can view and track all of your accounts in one single place. Now Wealthfront can track both your Wealthfront and non-Wealthfront bank and brokerage accounts as well. That uh, They'll provide a summary of all your assets for you so you can take a look. You can see every trade that Wealthfront makes on your behalf 
in your dashboard, on your desktop, or they also have a mobile app that you can use. Wealthfront manages over $2.6 billion in client assets. It's growing rapidly every day, so you have nothing to wait for. Do it now. Invest in your future today with Wealthfront. Visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. You're going to see the customized allocation that they're recommending for your profile. And just for Twit listeners, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. Join the many Twit fans who have seen huge success with Wealthfront and claim your offer today at Wealthfront.com slash TNT. All right, TNT's fan of the day is Kip at Kipowski on Twitter, who says he's, quote, listening in Sweden, on my way to work, shopping food, doing my laundry. I enjoy the company and the knowledge. Thanks, Kip. We enjoy having you along for the ride, as we do everyone who watches, who listens, and especially who sends us uh, hashtag how I watch TNTs. Show us how you watch or listen. Just record a video, take a picture of your setup uh, or yourself, post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, Facebook. We're checking them all. Use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we will find it. Ars Technica reports on new proposed legislation in New York that would require drivers in a crash to immediately submit their phone to testing to find out if they were using it during the accident or not. So like instead of a breathalyzer test, it would be sort of a textalizer test. And the law would make it so drivers were given, giving, they were, you're basically giving implied consent by operating a vehicle. Uh, in an interesting twist, the company behind the textilizer technology is none other than Celebrite. That's the company that we think is also behind the FBI crack of the iPhone of the San Bernardino shooter. Uh, what do we think about it? It turns that? out they're very good at analyzing iPhones. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> it's kind they, of their thing. They said that this would respect your Fourth Amendment right of privacy, that you would, uh, they would not, they would only see if you were using the phone. They wouldn't yeah. see what was on the phone. Yeah, that's cold comfort for, I'm sure, a lot of people who figure, you know, the second you're giving your phone over it with implied consent, which basically means if you get a driver's license, you're essentially giving them, uh, you're essentially saying, if I'm ever pulled over, for, you know, and, and they wanted to give me a breathalyzer test by the fact that I have a driver's license, I'm saying, yes, you can do that. And so then if you deny it, and in this case, it would be the same here uh, with, you know, handing over your device. If you deny that, you instantly, you know, lose your driver's license. And in many cases, worse, you know, they might just, they, they probably will take you in, uh, you know, depending on the case. So um, some people are just going to feel like, man, handing over my device with that implied consent what else are they going to do? You know, um, in, in this case, they're saying that all they're doing, it's like a light version of what Celebrite has already produced, which are roadside devices that can kind of scrape the contents from the phone. Mm -hmm. This is like a light version of that that just kind of analyzes usage stat as far as like last thing that was done, last time it was used. But I really wonder, A, how easy that is to get go beyond that if if one were so inclined not not saying that it would ha would or would not yeah. happen, but you know it would be nice to know that. And B, how detailed this is from you know it, there are a lot of variables in using your mobile device when you're driving. Not everybody is is putting their hand on their device and using it in that regard. There is mo there is voice actions and is the data analytics on the phone broken down such that voice actions is logged differently than something that's you know when you use your hand to type something on the screen. I think those are two different scenarios, and depending on the state, that actually makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, don't text and drive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also. yes. The, the the wider thing is, yes, don't touch your, your device while you're driving. Yeah, I mean, nine people every day in the U.S. die oh, it's, from it's distracted horrible. driving. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those complicated things. Yes, exactly. Sure. Like, it's a privacy issue. Um, but I also think that we all need to do better about uh, distracted driving. Absolutely. Um, oh man, the amount of times I'm like driving along and I look over and I see someone like, I know. Oh man, I, do, I mean, it, what can you do? It's a try. What are you gonna do? Honk at them? That's just gonna make the, you know, ah, yeah, uh, make the situation worse. And I don't want to do that. Um, but yeah, it's just frustrating uh, because it's just so incredibly dangerous. So mm -hmm. Don't do that. Thank you. Uh, okay, well that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, see this this soapbox? I'm going to step off it. Right. Tomorrow's guest will be Roberto Baldwin from Engadget. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You'll be a part of the show by emailing us. That's TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail. That's 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. If you want to be the first to get our show and you can't watch it live, then subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. If you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks, as always, to our technical director today, Kara Cole, and all the folks, including Greg, the artist, who help us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Pew.